Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and why is it that video game companies consistently choose to destroy themselves? Now ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you a little graphic here. This is Creative Assembly. This is a game studio that made amazing games like Halo Wars 2, Alien Isolation. I know that IGN didn't like it, but it's probably one of the best games from the PlayStation 4. They ended up saying, we made the incredibly difficult decision to begin, a, to begin a redundancy consultation process in some of their UK operations, and then the development of a game known as Hyenas. So basically, they're actually cutting the fat out of their company, they're doing a bunch of layoffs, because, ladies and gentlemen, there's been a lot of money that has been lost in this situation. Now, one thing to understand is the actual company behind here, Sega, which is what we're talking about, they actually own Creative Assembly. Yeah, Sega basically said that they were losing a crap ton of cash this last quarter. So somewhere around 14.3 billion yen for the fiscal year ending in March 31, 2024. That's losses, okay? That's just straight money that is gone from the company. To convert that to US dollars, 95.7 million US dollars lost, poofed, in the red. Now, to understand, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody that obviously, like, gets excited at the failure of an industry that I hold very dear to me. But honestly, I get kind of, like, confused. So for anybody that doesn't know, this game, Hyenas, was a hero-based multiplayer extraction shooter. Yeah, you ever heard of the term extraction shooter? I guess the best way to put it is, like, initially games like The Division, where you go into the dark zone, you find an item, and you escape with the boys. Uh, games like Escape from Tarkov. You know, basically any game where you squat up, jump into a location, uh, where you basically find good loot, you know, fight PvE enemies. Sometimes other players show up, and you kill them, and then you basically extract with your loot. Or you don't, okay? That's sort of like the uh, twist to it. That's where the hype comes from, right? Whereas with Battle Royales, the fun was dropping in and a hundred players, only like one or four would ever survive, depending on how you were squatted. Or with an extraction shooter, it's finding that juicy, legendary level five drop loot and getting the fuck up out of there, okay? Now, of course, this market is very, very oversaturated, right? There's not just the indie games, there's also the big AAA stuff. You've got Escape from Tarkov, you've got Warzone DMZ, you've got shit like um, Marathon from Sony that's coming out, which I would have hoped would have been a single player, you know, shooter, but no, we're done with that. Single player, nobody plays that anymore. Everyone's got to get that PvPVE grind going. Now, because of the oversaturation, you could imagine that Hyenas is about to step into a puddle of shit with everyone. So either it does something super duper unique, or it chooses to die out. Now, I looked into the entire footage for this game, and it wasn't exactly blowing me away. Like, it kind of looks like a mix of Borderland 3's graphics, with, again, this, like, almost Fortnite-esque attire. Was there anything unique being done in this game? No, I actually looked into actual gameplay from other players, people who got access to the betas, the closed betas. And it honestly looks like that kind of game that, like, you would see in, like, GTA, like, one of the characters would be playing on the TV, like a parody video game, almost. Very overly flashy, something that, honestly, could have been made by pretty much all the other companies out there. It's, it's almost soulless in a way, too. Now again, this game could have been great, it could have not been great, but the point is, nobody will know. And the reality of it is, is because of all those losses, Creative Assembly has to put this game out to pasture. Now, something about live service games, you know, some of them can work really well, right? Like, if you ask me what's a great example of a live service game, Fortnite, uh, Rainbow Six Siege. I don't play it all that much, but Siege does live service in a great way. So live service is a weird way to define a game. Basically, it's always online. It's a game that constantly has content coming in and out as part of the live service, right? So for me, initially, when the stuff started happening, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, you buy one game and all the DLC and expansion pack material comes with it for free. You know, back in the old days of buying a multiplayer shooter like COD, you had to buy the game on disc, uh, which you still do, but back in the day, you had to buy expansion packs, map packs, okay, season passes. So when you bought a game for 60 bucks, you bought a season pass for $60 to guarantee that you could get at least four expansions throughout the year, right, each season. Nowadays, with a lot of these games, what's cool is, hey, I bought Siege once, it's gonna give me the operators, it's gonna give me the maps, access to them for free. I don't gotta pay anything else. 
The only difference here is I gotta grind like 40, 50 hours a week in order to get the renown or to get the microtransaction currency or the earnable currency to buy the content. Which again, brings up the interesting thing, right? Like do you pay with your time or do you pay with mom's credit card, okay? If you got access to mom's credit card, you're probably gonna use that, okay? And if you factor in the amount of money that's being charged for all the stuff in live service games, it's a pretty penny. We're talking uh, access to new skins, skins that cost like $25 now on average. Back in the day, an entire map pack cost like $15, $20. Now that's like one cool skin on a gun or a character. That's it, all right? And we're all guilty of doing it. I think anybody that's played a shooter like Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Siege, Warzone, you probably bought a skin or, 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 or a crate that you've unboxed, like a little slot machine game too. That's part of these experiences now. Yeah, this is the world of gaming. And in a lot of ways, yeah, there's a positive aspect to live service. Everyone is on the same footing. Everyone has access to the same maps. So we're not sitting there matchmaking for 30 minutes because we didn't buy the map, but somebody else did. That's cool. The problem is the hyper monetization aspect of it. Now for a game like this, one thing that I look into with a lot of these companies is what their other locations are. So Sega, or Sega Sammy, actually has not just the video game business, but they make a lot of money in the Pachi slot and Pachinko machine businesses. So for those of you who don't know what pachinkos are, they're slot machines. They're Japanese, uh, they're, they're the Japanese way of getting by gambling laws, basically. And the thing is, there is a lot of money to be earned in gambling. That's no doubt about it, okay? Fuck, there are entire live streaming sites that are basically kept up by gambling services, okay? That's the world we live in. Gambling makes a lot of money. What I think for a lot of these businessmen and women who work for these companies, they probably look at this division and they're like, how can we get some of that money to go to the user base that plays Sonic, right? Which is why a lot of games now have fucking unboxing mechanics, have slot machines built right into them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the world we live in, okay? And what benefits them moving this audience here is with this audience, you don't even have to pay them out. <laughs> They just keep spinning and playing slot machines with no actual reward. So I feel like that's where a lot of these game companies go into. But when I look at a lot of these losses, something that always feels shady to me is how is it that a game company can like basically finish this product like Hyenas almost on like the release window. Like this game is about to come out. And then all of a sudden they cancel a creative project and lay off a bunch of people. It almost smells like a very cheap and dirty way to pay off your friends or to do a tax write-off in the worst ways possible. Because here's the thing, it's not like if you spent like millions of dollars on the development of this game, that money is just thrown into nothing. Obviously you paid contractors, you paid people, money was shared around. And at the end of the day, Sega and Creative Assembly get to write off this entire thing as a near $95.7 million loss, okay? Reducing their tax burdens and then costing our industry, A, people jobs, all right? That, that's the most important thing. But also, <laughs> this, is, this is a game that anybody could have seen would not have succeeded, okay? And I'm not here to just say that, again, I, I, it's not that I have a bias, it's just reality. In an oversaturated market, Hyenas was not doing anything that would separate itself apart from the big industry heads. So realistically, this game was always meant to fail. It was gonna be a live service game where on maximum, there was gonna be like maybe 8,000 players playing, which is not anywhere near enough to sustain this game and its server life, life cycle. A lot of these games that come out die within a fucking year, okay? And a more extreme example are games like Babylon's Fall, right? Which literally had maybe five people playing. I'm not even exaggerating there. That game was alive for like, what, a year? before it died out, and this is just the reality. Even big stuff like Marvel's Avengers, live service game, could have easily been a single player experience, could have easily been remembered to come, died literally a month ago, this month even, went completely like defunct. And that's Marvel's. Imagine Hyena surviving in a live, ser live service market. You were talking about a game that would have catered to maybe thousands of players. And the way that these games succeed is they got to have hundreds of thousands of players constantly drip feeding in that microtransaction currency. Because realistically, what I notice about a lot of companies is they chase the money in like the dumbest way possible. Every company thinks that they can make a video game and put it up there with like Call of Duty, Fortnite, whatever. Once you get these established brands, you really have to do something that's wholly different. 
I played tons of video games, even in the extraction shooter meta. This game does not do anything different. So obviously it was destined to fail. Unfortunately, a lot of people have lost their jobs, but one of the weirdest things is, is how game companies can continue to constantly shoot themselves in the foot. This is a game that would have been showcased at E3. People would have laughed about it. And that should have been enough to show you that maybe just the actual market you were trying to appeal to wasn't going to just play your game. Ladies and gentlemen, this is me, Mudahar, and uh, yeah, the gaming industry is a wild, wild thing indeed. Uh, I am out.